knowledge in depth will still be the possession of experts, of academic scholars, people who really go in in some detail into 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 a subject. Information, on the other hand, will be accessible to anybody with access to a phone and the internet. When you are born as a human being, you carry the debt of being a human by expressing yourself through empathy. But it's also um, harvesting the knowledge that those platforms are able to create in this new digital world, and particularly the social media. We bring this program, GL of Toronto, to you with the idea that collectively we can make a difference, that artists and writers and thinkers and speakers, they consider, they look into the past, they consider the present and they envision a better future for each and every one of us. A very warm welcome to the last session of the day. On behalf of Namita Gokhale, William Dalrymple, Sanjoy Roy, and my colleagues at Team Arts and JLF Toronto, we are delighted to present this session of JLF Toronto 2021. The new narratives, the art of immersive so storytelling. Zoe Vitel, Dean Hap Korolitz, and Shekhar Kapoor in conversation with Shunali Kulish Shaw. The session is presented in partnership with Token Mains LLP. The digital age is transforming how readers and audiences interpret and consume literary fiction. Zoe Vitel, Dean Hap Korolitz, and Shekhar Kapoor discuss the evolving nature of text, script, and screen narrative. In conversation with Shunali Kulashrov, they discuss how they create immersive narratives that reinterpret literary works. Introducing our speakers, Zoe Vitel. Zoe is the author of The Spectacular and the three previous novels, The Gala Shortlisted Party, The Best Kind of People, Lambda winning holding still for as long as possible and debut Bottled Rocket Hearts. She has published three collections of poetry, The Best 10 Minutes of Your Life, Precordial Thump and the Emily Valentine Poems. She's also a Canadian Screen Award winning TV and film writer with credits on The Baroness Won't Sketch Show, Schitt's Creek, Degrassi and others. Our next speaker, Jean Half Korolitz, is the New York Times best-selling author of the novels The Plot, you Should Have Known, which aired on HBO in October 2020 as The Undoing, starring Nicole Kidman, Hugh Grant, and Donald Sutherland. Admission, which was adapted as a film in 2013, starring Tina Fey, The Devil and Webster, The White Rose, as well as The Interference Powder, a novel for children. A company, Book the Writer, hosts pop-up book groups in which small groups of readers discuss new books with their authors. Shekhar Kapoor is an award-winning director, producer, and entrepreneur. He has not only become a prominent figure in Indian cinema with iconic films such as Mr. India and Bandit Queen, but also in Western cinema with the Oscar-winning Elizabeth and Elizabeth the Golden Age. In addition to his prolific contribution to cinema, Kapoor has been an honorary scholar at MIT and more recently has become president of the Film and Television Institute of India. In conversation with Shunali Kuleshrov, Shunali is the best-selling author of Love in the Time of Affluenza and Battle Him of Bewildered Mother. She writes on travel, modern Indian life, culture, and feminism for a host of publications. All our sessions will be available to view later on our Facebook page and YouTube channel. Do follow our social media handles and press the bell icon to get the notifications of the upcoming sessions. But before we start with the session, may I please invite Len Rodness from Talk in Mains LLP to say a few words. Greetings, book lovers. My name is Len Rodness. I'm a partner at Torkin Mains LLP and a longtime fan of the Jaipur Literature Festival. On behalf of Torkin Mains, I would like to welcome you to this session of The New Narratives, The Art of Immersive Storytelling, and to extend my appreciation to the organizers of JLF Toronto for bringing us this world-renowned festival. We are so pleased to have been a supporter of JLF Toronto since its inaugural event at the Young Theatre in September 2019. It's unfortunate that we aren't able to meet at a live event this year, but we are thrilled to help bring you this session and we look forward to gathering with you all in person in the future to celebrate this wonderful festival. Enjoy the session. Thank you, Lynn, and the entire team of Talk in Mains for your support towards the festival. Really appreciate it. Ladies and gentlemen, now presenting the new narratives, the art of immersive storytelling. 
So you could tell Dean Hapkarlitz and Shikhar Kapoor in conversation with Shanali Kulashraw. Shanali, over to you. Hello, everybody. It's great to see you all here today. We have a really interesting panel. We have with us an eminent film director, filmmaker, and two writers who write poetry and screen writing, and they do they write novels. So uh, I think I'd like to start with Shekhar first, and then you know we can um, have everybody else involved in the conversation. Shekhar, uh, you know there is nowadays a novel to TV pipeline. Uh, it's become all too common, but none of this is new to you because you have created um, a lot of, uh, you've created iconic cinema, some of which has come from book adaptations. What I want to ask you is, I mean, you have, Masoon was an adaptation, uh, Bandit Queen was an adaptation, and so was Four Feathers. Am I right? Correct. Well, um, yeah, Bandit Queen, the novel was written for the film. So it was oh, written for them. So I stand corrected. But nevertheless, uh, it was source material existed in that book. No, now, the source material was created by the writer of, this, of, of the film. So I, when she created everything, she created the film and then she. Mala Sen. Yeah. Mala Sen, right? Okay. Uh, so, okay, here's what I want to ask you about the other films, at least, that. Uh, novels and movies are two very different narratives. Uh, how difficult is it to distill the essence of a story which exists in the world of words and, you know, the readers and the writers' imagination and convert it into a visual medium? What are the artistic challenges involved? Well, a very simple answer to that is that the OTT platforms and the way we are seeing, we are consuming uh, media now is easier for it to be converted in from novels to OTT to television or to Netflix or Amazon or something like that. Now films have the idea that you, it's compressed narrative. You have to really, really work hard to find the source and then plot from A to B to C. And in between, you have to put in what is a subtext. You know, constantly you're thinking of the underlying subtext, subtext, and how do you in your visual form and in the narrative adapt some kind of adaptation to the life of somebody or to a novel and create subtext? Because we not normally have one hour, one and a half hour, two hours maximum to tell a story, which is like, you know, I made Elizabeth and it was like the life and times of this great British icon compressed into an hour and 40 minutes, an hour, how do you do that? You know, so you, you're faced with the with this, that your architecture of the film and your narrative and the performances must enclose within a lot of subtext so that you feel that you watched a lifetime. Um, but if you say that the, the, the new novel is obviously the, the, the OTT platforms and series, yeah. But I, I like the, I like the stress of that. I enjoy the stress of having to go in and find and adapt to and to create and to find the essence. Now that essence that you have may not be the essence of who wrote the novel. It is an essence that you derive from it. So it becomes a personal art film, te film, uh, film, te uh, filmmaking. So that's the difference between the two. So you are saying you enjoy the challenge of presenting it in a shorter time window on screen uh, as opposed to doing like a long form series because you like the challenge. Well, having done both, yes, I like the challenge of having to interpret because there's greater interpretation in, in the short form because you're forced to do that. You're forced to compress drama down. So I enjoy that. Yeah, I enjoy that stress. Yes. Jean, uh, when, how did the adaptation of your book, You Should Have Known, come about? How did it become the undoing? Did you just get a random call one day? <laughs> you I kind of did. But actually, before I answer that, I just want to say that it's so funny that I'm on this panel because I would have tuned into this panel uh, to learn how to adapt for screen and stage. This is something that um, I'm about to do for the first time with the plot. I'm, I'm going to be on the writing staff for the plot and I have no idea what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm really here to learn from you guys. Um, 
So what happened with the plot, ironically, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, with that you should have known is another producer had actually optioned that book. And um, I never heard from that producer. I never got an email or a call. Night, love your novel, nothing like that. So months went by and I heard from my agent that she was hiring and firing writers. She couldn't seem to find a writer that she liked. And then the option ran out and I thought, well, that's that. Um, you know, we novelists, uh, you know, and, and Zoe may or may not agree with me, you, you feel lucky that somebody wants to option your work and you, you take the check to the bank and you, you deposit it and that's usually the end of the story and um, things kind of fall apart at every step along the way. And so, so that, that just obviously wasn't going to happen. And then a couple of years later, I, I remember I was walking my dog just made an appearance back there um, in the park and my phone rang and it was my agent telling me that David E. Kelly had just bought uh, the book and I, I was completely shocked. And what I heard later uh, in an interview with him, he never even said this to me, although I, I have met him. Um, he said that when he first read uh, the novel, you should have known, he thought, wow, interesting characters, interesting situation, but the novel kind of decelerates uh, rather than accelerates in the second half. And of course, that's one thing for a novel, but it's not what you want in a television series. So he had kind of reluctantly passed on it, but he found that the characters in the situation stayed with him. So he went back and read the novel again, and he thought, well, we can take these characters in this situation and basically write a different kind of story, which is what he did. He prepared me at the outset for it being a very different interpretation of the novel. Um, and I was okay with that because I had been through the process, the adaptation process with my novel admission. Um, so I was extremely zen about it by the time we got to, uh, to You Should Have Known. But I mean, I, 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 I remember I congratulated my agent and she said, don't congratulate me. I didn't do anything. The phone just rang and it was David E. Kelly's attorney buying the book. So it's really very interesting that you say you had no apprehensions when uh, you, know, you uh, sold your book rights, adaptation rights. And I know you've been through it before with, uh, with uh, admissions. Admission. Yeah. But, you know, you create these characters and you read life into them and you yeah. birth them. Yeah. And then to have another screenwriter do whatever the heck they want to do with it, yep. uh, how hard is the process of detaching yourself from that? It's, you know, it's, it was hard. It was very hard the first time. But many years ago, I think it was the first time I met uh, Meg Wallitzer, who's another novelist, uh, American novelist. And I, I, I met her at a party and I had just seen an adaptation of her novel which was called um, This Is Your Life. It was made into a film by Nora Ephron called This Is My Life. And it was completely different. I, I had really enjoyed the novel. And I just, I said to her, wow, what was that like watching your book be, you know, really changed? And she said it, it was a variation on a theme. And I remembered that years later when I, um, when admission was happening, I was saying, you know, what I wrote is what I wrote. I was in this character's head all the time and nobody questions how a narrator is in a character's head. That's what we do. Um, but you can't have that on a screen. You can't hear what Tina Fey is thinking unless you you know, bombard the viewer with right. hours of voiceover and who wants that. You have to show things, you have to communicate things in other ways. And I was, that's just not what I was about. So you make your peace with it and you let go. And if you, do, if you can't do that, don't sell your book. Yeah, that's, that's really good advice. Zoe, you're, you're at that point right now. Your new novel is about to be adapted uh, and you are also working on the adaptation as well. Am I right? Are you involved in the writing? There's no sound. Sorry, I've been involved Sorry. in almost every different position. Um, right now I'm working on a film adaptation of somebody else's book. And I've also adapted my own work to film and limited series. That's that the kind of people, is that what you were talking about? 
Um, no, for the best kind of people, I optioned it to Sarah Polly, the director, and she's writing and directing. So that's the first project oh, where I've just given it to somebody else. And because I'm such a fan of Sarah Polly, I felt really happy to just let her take it over. Um, and I was ready to let go of those characters and to give it to somebody I really trusted. Um, but I've had all sorts of ex different experiences. Um, with my second novel, I was hired to write on a film adaptation and then the, pro the producer and I had, a, had creative differences. So I ended up having to take that back. Um, and then I had a unique, I've had a unique experience this year at adapting somebody else's novel and completely changing it, which I never thought I would do. And, but it really just makes sense for the form and that helped me think about my own adaptations differently and also because I work um I, you know I've been publishing since 2001 but I started to work in tv in 2014 and it really is a you know all the rules of writing good television are are the opposite rules of writing good prose and vice versa and so um but I do think that that um both have informed the other really well like there are ways that I approach scene work and plot and structure differently now when I write fiction than I did before I knew how to write a tv script and um similarly sorry my cat is just really wanting to be involved in the panel today um similarly you know there are ways that uh the fact that I've been writing long form fiction for a number of years before I got into television um has really uh you know, allows me to have a bit of a unique way to get into um, to television and film. Um, and there's there's something sort of interesting about what can come out on the screen or on script when you haven't um, done the normal kind of, you know, television school or the CFC or different ways of studying script writing. If you come to it from a different form, you can kind of produce interesting results in the, you know, optimistically. Thank you. Uh, Shekhar, you worked with uh, Javi Dakhtar, with Guzar, with Michael Hurst, uh, just to name a few, uh, for all these movies that, you know, we watch today and our children watch and they continue to engage us and you know, they're, they're, they're always going to be relevant. You've created classic cinema. What I want to ask you with regards to these movies uh, specifically is how involved were you in the writing process of the film? Let me just say, I'll answer that question. Let me take something that is very interesting that's coming up between all of us. You asked film writing and novels. First, if I could write a novel, I would write a, write a novel rather than make a film. It's just an, a discipline that I can't get. I, I don't know how people can just switch everything off. I think we're basically different personalities. As a filmmaker, I need to constantly interact with people, with my actors, with my editor, with my producer. I have this great admiration for people who can lock themselves in and just produce novels. I wish I could do that. But one more thing, if any of you who have watched Elizabeth, how did it come? How did the end of Elizabeth come? We walked into, and with Michael Hurst, we walked into the National Portrait Gallery and saw a picture of Elizabeth with white makeup looking great. And we said to ourselves, how do we end the film on that? And so what we did was, and you can only do this in film, you can't do this in, on, on, on uh, TV series, you can't do it in a novel. We just, ha and then we realized that the theme of our, of our film is going to be, why does a woman have to become a virgin to be powerful? We picked that theme. And she was called the Virgin Queen. So we said, yeah, that's the theme of the film. So we just had her shave her head off and put on white makeup and uh, put, you know, and stand in front of the mirror and say to her lady in waiting and say, look, I have become a virgin. And then appear in the film with this white makeup and go to her, to, to you know, to her, um, one, one of her courtiers and say, look, I am married now. I'm married to England. All of that was five minutes of the film. And nobody questioned it. No historian questioned it. That there is the power of cinema. I don't know how 
we could have ever done that in a novel. You know, it's just the imagery and everything, and you portray this thing. In five minutes, you kind of achieve what you want to and never get questioned. There is that magic that cinema has, and which I'm not sure if I ever tried a novel, I could do that in you know, five pages. I couldn't tell the story. So we, we just told the story of Elizabeth in five minutes at, at the time, what the essence was. So, yes, but for your second question, it's a tough relationship between a, a writer and a filmmaker because if you're a filmmaker who just accepts everything you're not a good filmmaker the problem the writers have with me is i want to know every door they walk through so i know and i understand every door that they walk through before they wrote so that when i interpret it on screen i have been through those doors already and then i need to find the doors that they haven't walked through that i must walk through to portray what i need to do and then I have to give it to the actor to walk through and then the editor walks through. So it's a co constant process for making as a con. But so, yes, I get very involved with all the writing myself because I don't know otherwise how to interpret it. Unless I have seen through it, through the mind and the various little, little pores and the ideas that came to the writer's head. I want to know them all. I'm, I'm greedy about that, you know. So, yeah, I'm constantly involved. But there is this constant... Filmmaking is not just directing, it's writing, and then it's directing, and then it's re redone at the editing phase. It's interpreted through the words and the way the actor responds. So it's a much more collaborative process than writing is. But when you're working with stalwart, stalwarts, has it been easy to have a smooth understanding of who walks through whose door, or has there been a little tension on the set sometimes, or what yeah. the story it goes to if filmmaking was that easy, everyone would be doing that. You know, we do it. I do it because it's difficult. Writers write because it's tough. It's because if we are putting ourselves, you know, that's what we're doing to our brains and our minds. We're just going like that, you know. I suddenly, are we masochistic? Do we like to be living as schizophrenics? I don't know. We're partly schizophrenic because we're constantly living who we are not. Mm -hmm. So it's tough. It's really tough. But are we addicted to it? I think we are. I, I don't know. I would ask, just ask myself, you know, fellow panelists here, that is it is 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 the pain addict is pain an addiction? Is emotional ringing an addiction? Is that why we do what we do? You know, it is. It's not as easy as you're asking. It's like, of course, I've come up with, with the writers. Michael Hurst wrote a book about me, and said, so I know Shaker. If he's driving, he's going to tell his. Because I would say, Michael, there's more emotion. There's not enough emotion. I need more. I need that line doesn't lead to that line. Why? Not because it doesn't. Because I don't feel it. Then I have to understand why I don't feel it and he feels it and I don't. So he said he's probably telling his driver, drive faster, drive faster, drive faster. So it's a painful thing to do, but we love it. I don't know. Let's ask my co panelist, why do you love it so much? <laughs> Well, can I can I answer that? First of all, I want to say that there are not many films that I've seen in my life that I remember the last line of, but I remember that line because it was so brilliant. Um, but would it have been brilliant if we weren't also looking at that image of Kate Blanchett's face and you know saw the process of her whitening her face and and uh, shaving her head no i mean that that's just the kind of thing we don't get to do in uh in fiction and also you can't overplay your hand you can't bombard the reader with uh visual uh descriptions because it's exhausting uh, you have there's a lot of you know pulling back and uh figuring out what's too much and what's not enough um i don't know zoe you might disagree with that but um I just want to say, listening to you talk about uh, being addicted to other people, and uh, it's not that we're hermits. It's not that we, you know, don't need to see other people as well. But I will say that the two times that I was on the set of a film or a television show based on something I wrote were two of the most thrilling experiences of my life. Because you walk onto the set, and on one hand, you're completely irrelevant to everything happening there. You're so deeply unimportant that, yeah, you know, I, I was introduced to people on the set of The Undoing as the author of the novel. 
And I swear, they said to me, um, there's a novel. I mean, they, they, did, they didn't know I was that unimportant. But at the same time, every single person there, from Hugh Grant to the person putting down the tape to the person, you know, serving the food, is there because of something you made up, probably in your pajamas, probably, you know, cross-legged on your bed in your pajamas with your dog, you know. And that is just the most exciting thing imaginable. And I'm I'm really looking forward to doing it again. But it, it's this crazy juxtaposition of deeply unimportant and absolutely crucial to the endeavor that is so weird. It's just weird. <laughs> what do you think, Zoe? Is that, would you concur with that? I would absolutely concur with that. It's a very strange feeling. And it's also just, you know, I, I divide my time up between working by myself in my room writing books and then occasionally I'll be thrown into a writing room for a tv show and it's such a different experience because t television is such a collaborative medium you know I ha I've had scripts appear on screen where it says written by Zoe Whittall and that but every sometimes there are scenes I didn't even know existed like because everything is written you know in the final draft it's all the showrunner who has to sort of make last minute decisions, if there's a budget problem or there's something that has to shift and it, it happens very quickly, the original writer is usually not the one to make those changes. And so, and also like every episode of television, every season of television is written by, I mean, in Canada, it's usually 10 to 15 people in a room. And then one person gets the credit because they actually did the physical writing down. But um, but what, what shifted for me when I was started to work in television was I had to let go of the feeling that my words belong to me. And oh, that wow. I to them, right? Because when you're writing fiction, you, you have such control and it's all, it's your vision. And then your editor sort of helps you. They, you know, editors bless them. I would be nothing without them. And they, they really are like a, a warm presence. But in television, it's, it's some, everybody is writing for, you know, it's an art form, but it's also every single word you write is vetted by somebody in a suit who either is or isn't going to give you millions of dollars. And so, you know, it's a, it's really different in that way um, in terms of who has the control and who ultimately, um, you know, gets to have the power to tell the actors what to say. So, and it's just, they're just, you know, so many people involved in that fi when the cameras fin finally roll. And it was really great for me to learn how to work collaboratively and to become, you know, having to be in that room and come up with ideas like, like quickly. I was shocked the first, first couple of weeks in a writing room, I was just shocked at how quickly TV writers can think and how fast they have to come up with ideas. And when they, when the showrunner or the, the network says that's not going to work, you have to immediately throw it in the garbage and start again. And that is just, that's a real skill that I felt like I didn't have that muscle and I've slowly, slowly developed that muscle. And it's actually kind of helped me when I go back to writing books, it's helped me let go of ideas that maybe didn't serve the plot or it helps me rethink of the kind of world of the, of the book um, differently. Yeah. What you just said that one sort of writing informs the other. So I think I, this is what you're trying to say that you're actually becoming a better novelist by being a screenwriter. Is that right? In some ways, I do think so. Yeah. I mean, that's what I hope for. So let me ask you something. You know, they say the end writes the beginning and shapes the middle. But now with long form uh, television on OTT platform, uh, the desire for a new season makes writers push the ending further and further away. There's almost always a demand for that, right? What I want to ask you is that how authentic is one's writing then? How spontaneous is it when you're constantly thinking of expanding the middle endlessly and throwing in, you know, unexpected scenes and twists and in the plot? So as a novelist, I would ask you that, do you, would you call that authentic writing? I think that's interesting because in some ways, you know, network television, you used to have to write, uh, you know, triple the amount of, of episodes that a streamer wants, you know, and, and, and Netflix lately has been just cutting seasons off at, you know, seasons one or two, and then they end it. Um, 
And so I think it's really shifted in the last few years. The pressure to kind of make shows go on and on is actually rare, a rare gift in some ways. Um, so I don't, I'm not sure how to answer that. I also haven't been staffed on a show that's gone on long term. So I don't, I don't really know how right. to, to answer that. Jean, would you like to talk about this a bit? Yeah, I'm just thinking about it at, at, as uh, you were talking. I was looking up at my bookshelves and thinking about Tom Parada, who's a friend of mine and a, and a writer I truly admire. And when his novel, The Leftovers, uh, was published, uh, you know, he became a writer and eventually, I think possibly even the showrunner uh, for the adaptation. I think it was HBO, The Leftovers. And, and the first season only covered his novel. I mean, it ended where the novel ended. And when they came back for, you know, season two and then season three, uh, the, what he did just deepened what he had done in the novel. And um, I mean, that's kind of a, a, a model to me if I'm ever in, in that situation. As for the plot, I actually can't say a lot about the plot because it hasn't been uh, announced yet. But, you know, I remember an early conversation with the producer about how I saw this. Do I see this as like a one season thing or, and nobody had ever asked me that about a novel. And I, and I hadn't thought about it in advance, which is probably why I did some of that fast thinking that you were just mentioning. And I said, you know, I definitely see it as, I, I see the novel as a season of television, but I also see a way to move forward after that. And she said something about, well, you know, we'll have to see how it does. <coughs> <laughs> Nothing moves forward if it hasn't been successful, which, you know, is, is, these are not the terms that we novelists tend to think in. So well, I'm learning a lot. That's all I can say. Shekhar, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, some movies get adapted and readapted. Say, uh, say Little Women was adapted some seven or eight times. Uh, and then there are movies that, uh, you know, the alchemy doesn't work somehow, doesn't translate on screen. As a filmmaker, uh, do you, what do you think a filmmaker looks for when he buys the adaptation rights of a book? What is the sort of book or what, what is the trigger in the head that says, you know, this will work? Look, I can only talk about myself. Right? Of course. I, I, um, I, I've always looked for an issue that resonates with me a moral issue, a moral conflict, something that's deeply affecting me. Otherwise, there's no point me even going there because I'll make a really bad film. Uh, that's one thing I do. And this question that you've raised about endings, I've never done a film in which I did not first know the ending. We just talked about Elizabeth. I knew that's where I had to end. Well, me and the writer, we knew that's where we had to end. And then we wrote the whole thing together to end there because the end encapsulated for me either the resolution or the furthering of the issue of well, the fundamental issue and the fundamental moral conflict that we want to deal with in that. So I admire this ability of, in writers to just go on season. And Michael Hurst, who wrote Elizabeth, went on to make Vikings, and I don't know, like you know, 20 episodes or 20 or 10 seasons or something. How he wrote them, I have no idea. But I worked with the same writer where we absolutely knew the end of the film before we even started from day one, you know, the first thing. Well, we know that's where we have to get to. So uh, I would only adapt a novel if it resonated with the film and then adapt the novel. I'm not saying shoot the novel. Adapt it to something within the novel that created fundamental moral tension inside me. You know, and then th therefore the end would reflect that moral tension that otherwise, how do I even make it from otherwise? You know, I become, I might as well be a DOP shooting it, you know, <laughs> because if I'm not doing it, what do I, well, what do I tell the actor? I have to share it with the actor. Otherwise, how do actors, I have to share with Kate or any other actor, this is what it's about. What's some fundamental idea so that all of us have a common vision to that. And, you know, you read a great novel, like, you know, all of you, both of you have written and everybody who's read the novel is going to come up with a different vision of the novel. A different interpretation and that's what's great about great novels you know sometimes even films if you watch 2001 space odyssey 
you know, the incredible thing about it is no one sees the film and does, no, everybody has a different interpretation of that film. And what is amazing about great cinema is that at every stage of my life, when I watched 2001 and Space Odyssey, I've been watching it for 30 years. Each time I've come up with a different interpretation of the end, a different story. And I'm sure that's what happens with great novels also. You see it differently. You read a different story. Because in a great novel, the pauses within the chapters or within the, the, the paragraphs are allowing you to, that's why I say storytelling often is not storytelling, it's story imagining. You're not telling the story. A great novel or a great film is the idea that the person indulging, listening, watching is story imagining. And so it's handed over to you for you to imagine. I'm speaking too much. But, when you, but as you do that, do you believe that uh, you know, while, of course, as a filmmaker, you can do all that you want to do with it, but at the end, something about what you have made should be, in, you know, in service, uh, uh, should be in sync with and rather a hat tip to the piece of art being translated. Do you agree with that? Of course. But a great piece of art has many, many issues that it's opened your heart out to. So you can choose from them. It stirred different things in you. Yeah, the painting behind you, right there, that I see, you know. I can see a story, and then in, in the next breath, I can see another story, another story. All comes out of that painting. Uh, I wanted to ask you, Zoe, that uh, when you were made, you, you've written on Schitt's Creek, mm -hmm. right? And uh, uh, how was the experience of, you know, working with an ensemble cast, uh, in the writer's room and also then have the, the the levies around. I'm sure they had, I mean, how much of a say did they have in the building of episode after episode of that uh, series? So I was only involved in, uh, for a short time as a story editor, but I was in the writing room and Dan Levy was the showrunner. And um, I believe if I'm remembering correctly, Eugene came in once per week to check on our stories and see what was up. And it was, it was lovely. Um, I really wish that I could have met Catherine O'Hara because I'm such a big fan, but you know, often writer's rooms are quite separate from the set. You know, I've been in the industry since 2014, but I've only managed to be on set once. So like usually, you know, we come up with what's happening and then it go, then, you know, it kind of the script has a life of its own. Um, but it's been, you know, uh, I did have the opportunity to to occasionally be an extra on the show Baroness von Sketch Show in some of the sketches, and that was really it was really fun to see how um, you know this creative vision that came out of weeks and weeks of sitting in a room with twenty of the most brilliant comedians I've ever met in my life. How it kind of ends up um, becoming a product and becoming what it what we end up seeing on on TV, and it's, it goes back to that idea of of the viewer and the reader. Um, you know, whatever we write is nothing, it's a participatory experience in the end, you know, and you can't control, you can't ever really control how somebody reads a book or sees a film or sees a piece of TV because of that participatory role. And, and especially for novelists, you can't, um, I was surprised my last book tour meeting so many people who would come up to me at the book table and tell me what they, what they thought the the book that they were supposed to take away from the book and it would always be something very different than what I had intended. And that's sort of the beauty of, of art in terms of, um, you know, it, it belongs to the person experiencing it. And part of being a writer is learning how to um, let go of that control and, and, uh, and kind of reveling in that, the experience of hearing what it was like for other people. That's exactly what Shaker just said in fact. Yeah. Jean, this is a slightly different question uh, uh, from what we've been talking about. Uh, you, I read somewhere that uh, you enjoy reading literature and you wrote your first two novels, they were literary fiction. And then you made a tactical decision and wrote a more commercial book. And you know, you saw some success with that. And then of course, after that, you've only been writing books that have gone and become bestsellers right away. Uh, what I want to ask you is that there's a certain amount of snobbery that accompanies uh, literary fiction, all right? And uh, it's uh, commercial writing isn't really uh, considered art form. Mm. What are your views on that? Uh, very complicated. Um, 
So it is true that the first two novels that I wrote were more literary. They were not, they were never published. Then I just thought I, 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 I've wanted to be a published writer my whole life. It's what I want to do with my life. And I, I need to, you know, make this practical decision and write a book that will be published. But immediate, and, and that was published. Um, but immediately I, I had a different problem, which was that my new editor wanted me to write a sequel to that book. And already I was moving in a different direction. And I've spent the next 25 years kind of bouncing back and forth over that line that divides commercial uh, from literary without ever really knowing where that line is. I don't think anybody knows where that line is. Um, I, I have discovered that I love plot, that plot that I, you know, the books that I loved as a reader were plot driven and beautifully written. So that's what you set out to do, to write a novel uh, in which every sentence earns its place on the page. And, uh, and, and the plots surprise you. And that's a tall enough order. Um, I think part of the reason I got to book number seven without many people knowing who I was is that I kept, you know, I kept disappointing people who had decided that they liked my more plot driven books and then the next book would be more literary and they would say goodbye. So um, it's been a definite problem for me in terms of uh, and finding an audience. And then um, it, you know, it's very funny when you should have known, uh, not when you should have known came out because it wasn't that successful when it came out. Um, but people now refer to it as my first novel. Oh, you know, yes, yes, the author of the plot. I read her first novel, you should have known. That was my fifth novel. But, you know, um, I'm happy to be here. I'm happy with the books that I've written. Uh, that I have a new novel coming out in the spring that nobody will confuse with a uh, commercial novel. I have no idea how that's going to be received. But I only get one book at a time. I can't... I don't have, you know, an array of books to choose from to write next. I have one, and my job is to make it the best book that it can be and, you know, hope that people like it. So it's been a bit of a curse, but on the other hand, I managed to get to eight novels, uh, and I'm still being published and still being read, and that's kind of the accomplishment that, I'm, that I focus on. Well, and that's how it should be. So yeah. that's a very rewarding uh, accomplishment, and then to see your work being adapted. So yeah, that was that was just that was the cherry on top, really. Uh, Shekhar, we've all been spoiled for choices with the OTT platforms and the streaming from our laptops and our screens at home. Uh, two years of the pandemic have sort of uh, made us just too comfortable with uh, home uh, home viewing. What I want to ask you is that do you think that something will alter in the way cinema is made or in the way we consume cinema once we start flocking back to movie theaters? And secondly, do you think that will happen? Do you think people will go back to movie theaters with the same, you know, uh, joy and excitement the way they did before uh, the pandemic hit us and OTT happened? Um, OTT has actually has changed the way people view because it's very good you know b before that it was all series and they were not very good you know you could watch them you could leave them but novel writing and writing on ott and drama on ott has suddenly taken off world over and it's become quite quite amazing so we are getting new plots new actors new directors new talent and people are watching it all at home. So your question becomes relevant, not because we've got used to OTT, but the fact that OTT has given us far greater quality than cinema has been giving us for a long time, right? So cinema now either has to go back to being James Bond and stay there for people to flock, flock back. I'm not even sure if they're flocking back there. Cinema has to go back to the big screen entertainment, or it has to be as good as the rocking and directing of OTT. And that's where it's changed. We have it at home, but it's not just because it's home, because it's become really good, really good. Uh, I think the, oh no, okay. Uh, 
I'm sorry, I just have a message. I'm trying to read that. Okay. Uh, I'm afraid it's time out for all of us. Uh, thank you so much, Shekhar, Zoe, and Jean. It's been wonderful and enriching to speak with you as a writer, as a novelist myself. I would have attended the session even if I weren't moderating it. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And thank all you. the best to you with your new movie, Shekhar, and Zoe, and Jean with your new adaptations and your screenwriting. And your stand-up comedy, Joey. I, I read about that as well. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Zoe, Jean, and Shekhar for a truly fascinating conversation. Shanali, thank you for being an amazing moderator for the session. We wish we could have received you all in person in Toronto for the session, but hoping in 2022. But thank you so much for being part of JLF Toronto 2021. Thank you all for watching and being a great audience. Once again, we'd like to thank all our partners for their support and a special thanks to Token Mains LLP for presenting this session. We hope you all enjoy this conversation and will tune in tomorrow for another day packed with exciting sessions featuring a stellar list of speakers that have been specially curated for you. Our first session for tomorrow is Client Earth, James Thornton, Martin Goodman and Madhur Anand in conversation with Mridula Ramesh, which is at 10 a.m. Eastern Time, 8 a.m. Mountain Time, 10 a.m. Central Time, and 7.30 p.m. Indian Time. If you're liking the sessions, please consider supporting us through the Pay What You Choose option button on the right-hand side of your screen. Your support is greatly appreciated. Thank you once again, and see you tomorrow. Knowledge in depth will still be the possession of experts, of academic scholars, people who really go in in some detail into, into, into the subject. Information, on the other hand, will be accessible to anybody with access to a phone and the internet. When you are born as a human being, you carry the debt of being a human by expressing yourself through empathy. But it's also um, harvesting the knowledge that those platforms are able to create in this new digital world, and particularly the social media. We bring this program, Jail of Toronto, to you with the idea that collectively we can make a difference. That artists and writers and thinkers and speakers, they consider, they look into the past, they consider the present and they envision a better future for each and every one of us.